Hello and welcome to the Star Wars Empire at War Expanded Thrawn's Revenge 3.0 patch notes. This version was just released today, so we're going to be taking a look at the major changes that have come with this release. Uh, this won't be completely exhaustive, but this is the vast majority of what we've been working on with this release, and there will be a bit more in the patch notes that are posted with the version itself. If you are subscribed on the Steam Workshop, you will automatically get these updates. If you would like to subscribe to the mod on the Steam Workshop, that's the easiest way to get it. Uh, there will be a link in the description, and soon we'll have a link up on Mod Database once any initial hotfixes have been put out. A large part of our focus in this version was on some of the galactic level mechanics which we'll be running down in a moment, uh, some of them that you may have already been playing with in Fall of the Republic, but there were also a ton of other uh, changes to existing units with redone assets or new units and other smaller mechanics. So we'll start off with a list of the new units that you can get in Thrawn's Revenge 3.0. There is the EXF, which is also known as the Rakehal. This is a unit that you're able to get if you conquer Enzoth when it unlocks. Two smaller fleet tenders have been added in the Star Galleon for the Remnant, Greater Maldrud, Zinj, and Ariadu Authority, as well as the Galleon, which is a similar ship for the Corporate Sector Authority and Penastar Alignment. The Liberator, an old favorite from Star Wars Rebellion, has been added for the New Republic and the Corporate Sector Authority. The Gladiator 2 for Zinj's Empire, which has replaced the Gladiator 1. There is a new version of the Dreadnought, the Dreadnought Carrier version for the Penistar alignment, giving them a bit more in the way of carrier options. And the Clutch Fighter has been added for the Greater Maldrude, a type of uh, kind of kit-bashed pirate fighter that was used by the Invids. There's also been the TIE X2 added for the Penistar alignment. And for the Viscount on the New Republic, there is now a Viscount prototype, which is the smaller Viscount itself. So when you research the Viscount, that's what you get which then opens up the possibility of building the full-sized Viscounts that are SSD-sized. There's also been the addition of the Mediator class for the New Republic, and the kind of a, a look at some much later content that's going to be coming when we get to the Second Galactic Civil War, with the addition of the Mon Calamari Heavy Carrier, uh, which you guys would probably know better under the name of Blue Diver, one of the specific ones from the Second Galactic Civil War. Both the Mediator and Blue Diver as new battlecruiser types for the New Republic are available in late era research. There have also been a few other units added for the New Republic, the Republic class Star Destroyer, which is also a research option, the Defender class Assault Carrier, and the Nebulon B support variant, which is also a fleet tender at heals ships around it. They have the new Hegene fleet tender, which and we have added a few more ugly fighters, which are kind of other kinds of kit-bashed fighters like the clutch I mentioned earlier, but there is the TIE Wing, which is a TIE fighter with a Y Wing, the X Scepter, which is an X Wing with a TIE Interceptor, the X TIE, the Y TIE, the Z TIE. So these are all different combinations of different fighter types that were common with, uh, with different pirate groups that are available in a few places. On the ground there is also the S1 Firehawk that has been added as a tank for the Ariadu Authority, and the PX-10, which is a very small tank, which has been added for Zinj. The SD-6s, which are a type of droid infantry, were also added as an influence reward on Balmora and for independent forces. On top of some of these new units, we've done new models for a ton of other pre-existing units. We've shown already the new SSD model updates that we've done. So the Executor, the Vengeance, and the Bellator have all been given new assets. In the future, the Eclipse and Sovereign will be following suit with this. In the previous release, we already did the Viscount. So that'll be, I think, every SSD pretty much redone. Uh, we also redone the Acclimator, which you guys may have been playing with in fall of the republic so both variants of that that are in thrawn's revenge already though the assault variant has also been added for the penistar alignment in thrawn's revenge there are new models for the dreadnoughts all versions of them so in thrawn's revenge that's the dreadnought heavy cruiser as well as the dreadnought carrier that we added to the penistar alignment the arquitens the carrick the strike cruiser the ton falc the ipv1 have all been redone as well, so that's a lot of the smaller end of the Imperial rosters. Crusader Corvette and Kadalbe have been redone, which are the two Mandalorian space units that are in right now. There's uh, been some model updates for the Lambda, and a lot of stuff that's been redone on the New Republic side in space and on ground, where we have redone the Majestic class, the Bothan Assault Cruiser, the Assault Frigate, which is kind of in line with the Dreadnought a bit more now, the CC-7700 and 7700E interdictor variants. The Sashin class has been redone, the Corona class, 
and then on ground, almost all of their vehicles have been redone. The T1B, T2, T3, and T4 have all been given new assets. The Heavy Tracker and Armored Freerunner have been swapped with the models from Phoenix Rising, another mod that you should check out and the viewing airspeeder has been updated as well. One of the most common questions we get is why there are no death clones in space. Uh, these are basically the kind of exploding and crumbling ship models that you'd see after a ship dies. Basically, this is because with our initial release of 1.0 in 2010, we had them all done, but then as we've redone assets, uh, it's been harder to keep up with that. So a few more of those have been uh, started to get done by a few people on the team. So you'll start seeing those kind of trickle in. There are a few that are in this update. There'll be more coming in the future. There is one other element to the new and redone units, which we'll talk about here altogether, and that's the Empire of the Hand. The vast majority of their space roster has been completely redesigned. A few new units have been added as part of that as well. So all of the units that are based on either the Chiss directly, so that's the Phalanx, the Syndic, the Fruro, uh, those units have all been redesigned around a more consistent theme, and the same with the kind of Imperial-derived ships like the Ascendancy and the Chaff. So every single one of those units has been completely redone. There are a few that are still yet to be redone that are kind of meant to be from other smaller groups in the Unknown regions like the Baumu. Uh, they'll be coming later, but all of those other uh, Empire of the Hand unit models have been redone, and a few more units have been added from the Chiss side, so the Intigo, which is a large battlecruiser for them, more on the defensive side, and the Sisygos, which is an anti-fighter unit that'll also be the core anti-fighter unit of the Chiss, have been added. Uh, on top of that, there is a new unit in the Empire-based uh, designs, which we've called the Ephodio Fleet Tender. This is a pretty large fleet tender that kind of fits into the same role that you might imagine uh, the Altor might, uh, or the DH Omni from Fall of the Republic. So it's a large kind of capital ship fleet tender. Some of their ground units have been rebalanced to help them be a bit more useful other than the Gilzean. We are still intending to redo the entire Empire of the Hand ground roster. So while they have fallen a bit behind other ground reworks, which we'll talk about in a bit here, they are still slated for all that stuff. It's just a matter of getting the actual designs done and assets done for that before we move too far with it. Now, staying on the visual side, there have been a few other pretty major reworks. There have been the all the shipyard models have been completely redone, as well as the Golan models, which should really help on all of the planets, giving a bit of an upgrade to the assets that are pretty common in the mod. Uh, but there have also been some changes to the Coruscant and Volcanic planet textures. These are things that you'll start seeing getting applied to all the other planets in the mod. Uh, one of the areas that we really want to improve on is the kind of environment uh, lighting and uh, environment assets where they are getting kind of old in the mod and we're trying to get those all up to par. So you'll see the same kind of thing happening with the other planet textures in the following releases. But there have also been a ton of updates to explosion particles and weapons particles, uh, things like the bombing run and orbital bombardment explosions, and a few other things there. So now we'll get into talking about some of the game mechanic changes, especially on the galactic level. We'll talk about galactic first, then get into the tactical level. The largest set of changes have been the inclusion of three new resources for the game. First up are the ship crews, which are the same kind of idea as credits. You have a basic income of ship crews from things like naval academies, uh, cloning facilities, and these are things that you spend along with credits in order to build your ships. The crew cost of a ship is displayed just under its name on its tooltip. Unfortunately, right now, there isn't a way for us to display ships that you can't afford the crew cost for. Uh, we will hopefully be able to change that in the future, but that's just how it is right now. If you can't afford the ship, then it won't show up on your build bar. And we've typically leaned towards having the income for ship crews be quite large right now while people get used to the idea that it's there. In the future, we'll be kind of clamping that down a little bit, so it's more of a thing you have to manage and is more in line with how you'd be using credits. The other two resources, food and industrial parts, are what we'd call rolling resources. These are resources that you aren't going to be stockpiling the way you'd have like a giant collection of credits or ship crews. Instead, these are things where you have a set income and a set expenditure per week based on the planets you have. You make them via ag reports or industrial parts factories. These are structures that you build on the planets and the icons all display what their income is going to be. And then each planet will also have a modifier. So some planets have uh, an extra cost to either of these resources. Some have an extra bonus to them. 
uh, planets like Yukio, for example, which are famously farming planets, they'd give you more food, whereas a planet like Coruscant that has a high population would take a lot more food to supply. When you have a positive income of these kinds of resources, then you have an additional plus one influence on all your planets, and that's one per resource. So if you are positive in both food and industrial parts, then you will have plus two overall influence on all your, all your planets. If you are negative in your influence, or negative in your resources rather, so if you are spending a lot more on supplying your planets than you are making from your farms and parts factories, then you will have a negative influence from them. Keep in mind, every factory and barracks you build is going to take industrial parts and food respectively. So every barracks you build is gonna be plus one food cost, which means you have to be a bit more careful in where you're gonna be spamming building. Part of what this is doing is making it so that the normal tactic that a lot of players on the faster end use, where you just blitz planets and then never build anything on them, is a little bit nerfed. Ultimately, Empire War is about the battles, and that's what we want to focus on, but when we have galactic management that doesn't really exist, then the best thing to do in almost every case is to take a planet, then immediately attack another planet. And what this means is that the AI almost never has a chance to, uh, to rebuild and have another fleet that you can actually get into a battle with. So with these kinds of mechanics, by giving a bit more to do on the galactic level and giving a reason to kind of slow down and allow everything to consolidate, it gives more opportunities for those higher impact fleet battles to happen. It also helps in making there be a reason to go for certain planets over certain other planets and plan out your expansion accordingly. There have been some other changes to influence as well. We've removed the timed influence where you would always get uh, plus one to plus three influence depending on how long you control the planet for. Uh, we've changed some modifiers even from the stuff that you would have been playing with in Fall of the Republic where if you are playing on easy, you have plus two influence. If you're playing on medium, you have plus one influence. And if you're playing on hard, you have plus zero. Uh, the AI, if you're on hard, will have a bit more influence and have a bit less if you're on easy. Blockading now is something that factors into planet influence as well. If you are over a planet, there is a 20% chance that a blockaded planet will lose one influence per week. So the longer the blockade, the more influence can be taken away. This only applies to planets that have fewer than four ground structures present, so basically the idea being that if they have more than that, then they're kind of able to self-supply for a bit, and they wouldn't lose influence from that as fast. Blockades can now also be fought off by ground-to-space weapons as well. So if you just have a fleet parked over a planet that has a ground-to-space weapon, like a hypervelocity gun or an ion cannon, then every week one of the ships in that fleet will be killed, so you can't just park like a single corvette over a planet that has a ground to space weapon and then just forget about it. Now with all these additional factors on influence, if you get to one, two, or three influence on a planet, and this applies to the AI as well, then there is a chance for an unrest stack to apply to the planet, and these are indicated by little fists to the left of the influence bar. If you have one influence on a planet, then it's 100% chance of getting an unrest stack. If you have two influence on a planet, then there is a 50% chance. And if you have three influence on a planet, it's a 33% chance. If you are above six influence, then one will get removed every week. If you hit three, inf or three unrest stacks on a planet, then the following week, the planet will revolt. This can sometimes result in factions that have been defeated or weren't present on the map at all, coming into play. So this is going to play into how some factions like Corellia show up at all in the future. When a revolt happens, all of your units or the AI's units present over the newly flipped planet that belongs to a new faction now will go back to another friendly planet of whoever owns those units. So you don't have to worry about losing a fleet to that. There have been some other story and other mechanical additions to the galactic maps as well. The Katana fleet mission, which used to be just in the Thrawn campaign, has been fixed and has also been applied for the Imperial Remnant and New Republic in the progressive campaigns. Uh, there's also been a change to the Yuvitha, who were pre previously just the planets would unlock in Era 5 and they'd kind of sit there. Now, even though they are still part of the Independent Forces faction, there will be a Yuvithan fleet that becomes active and starts raiding around the galaxy. So you do have to be a bit more careful about letting them get around. 
As I spoke about in the kind of unit update section, there has been a bit more focus on some research in the mod. Uh, you're now able to research the B-Wing E, which is a variant of the B-Wing for the New Republic. The new class modernization project ships come in through some research as well. Uh, ships like the RSD are coming in through research. The Bothan Assault Cruiser from previous versions is available when you have Borsphalia as your chief of state through research, which is something that existed before. Uh, stuff like the Viscount prototype uh, research. There's the Mediator and Mon Calamari Heavy Cruiser research, or Heavy Carrier research, rather. And this is stuff that we're going to be expanding throughout the mod and other places as well, though the New Republic has kind of been the guinea pig for that. The New Republic government options have been expanded a fair bit as well. In the previous version, you could only get Borsphalia, Leia, or Mon Mothma as your chief of state. Mon Mothma has been given a bonus now. She gives a bonus to your ship crew's income. So Leia is a boost to influence. Borsphalia is the galactic spy ability. And Mon Mothma is increased ship crews. But now you can also get Ponk Gavrisim, who gives increased influence on any planet that has any unique influence build, so planets like Mandalore and Hapes, where you can get the Kadalbe and the Haven Battle Dragon and that kind of thing. There's CN Tev, Gensar Sobel's Navik the Red, who gives a increase or a cost reduction to any defensive structures. If you go to the political options menu, you'll see a rundown on each of their kind of info cards on what they actually do. We've additionally changed the length of the election cycles. In the previous version, it was once every 15 weeks that the election would happen. Now it's once every 10 weeks. So you should be able to respond a bit more to how things change. We might play with that value a little bit more in the future, but for now we think that once every 10 weeks, having an election for your chief of state kind of makes sense. You're in a bit of a commitment with them, but you still have enough time that you can kind of plan around. In addition to the government options that have been expanded there for the chief of state, there is also the new command staff mechanic. So there are some factions, the New Republic especially, that have a ton of known heroes, and we want a way to include as many as we can, but we also don't want to overflow a faction with too many heroes, especially compared to other factions who may have fewer options. So one of the things that you're able to do with the New Republic is choose your main command staff. There are some heroes that are present regardless, but there are also a set of heroes that fit within certain slots for commanders. So you have generally three slots that you can fill, and there are a bunch of options for these. So this is where characters like Akbar and Firmus Nance and Cian Sov are kind of slotted in right now. Uh, wherever you have these commanders, you'll be able to choose to retire them if you want, and in the government options menu or the government tab, you'll see the current active commanders, and if you have an open slot, you'll have the option to uh, recruit one of many options. There have been a bunch that have been added for this, so I won't go into a whole list of them, but there are a lot of them. Uh, for example, there's Voon Masa, who has a Lucre Hulk. Uh, so there are some unique ships that you can get from this for the New Republic as well. Additionally, some pre-existing heroes have had some expansions in the ships that are available to them and how those work. Uh, so, for example, Garmbel Iblis has the option to upgrade through a few ships, including up to the uh, the Harbinger, which is his flagship during the part of the Yuuzhan Vong War. Uh, we've classed that as a mediator because that seems to be the most likely option, given that it doesn't have a direct classification in the lore. But with people like Akbar, who otherwise have a couple flagships that they'd go between. In previous versions, he'd be in the Home 1 until MC-90s become available, then he'd switch to the Galactic Voyager. What we've done now is given people the option, uh, once he's or once those ship types are available, you can put him in whichever of those that you want, and you can switch him back and forth. So if you'd prefer to keep the Home 1, even though the MC-90 is available, you can choose to put him back into Home 1, and if you then want to switch him over to Galactic Voyager because you want an MC-90, then you can do that as well. So there's a few more options there to kind of customize who your heroes are and how you're playing with them. And this is the kind of thing that's going to be coming to all of the factions in different ways to kind of help all the factions feel like they are playing very differently and changing your options with them. Another similar change that has been made already for the Imperial factions is with the bounty 
bounty hunter heroes. So in previous versions, these were typically assigned to one of the Imperial factions. So for example, Dangar and Boba Fett were part of the Greater Maldrud, and Bosk was part of the Ariado Authority. Uh, now, any of the Imperial factions has a build option to recruit a bounty hunter. You pay a certain amount of money, and you'll get a bounty hunter. There is a list of a few. Right now, it's just Boba Fett, Dengar, and Bosk. If there's any available, then the bounty hunter will come into service for you, and whoever gets them first gets them first. So technically, these heroes are now available to multiple factions. Only one can actually get them. Right now, if there are none available, it does unfortunately stay on the build bar. It gives you your money back, though. So in the future, we hope to be able to change this, but it'll require a bit of extra work on the back end to do that. So that'll get rid of the option when there's no bounty hunters left. Uh, but it will tell you if you build it, it'll say there aren't any free. So that's how they're going to work now. There'll be a few heroes kind of worked into that way. Because again, we want to be able to represent a lot of these characters because it's a a period that's full of a lot of characters, but we don't want to have too many heroes all at once, and we want to have ways to kind of make the factions interact a bit more. So that's where all that's coming from. There have been a few other changes and fixes for story stuff and for galactic mechanics, but we're getting past the 20 minute mark on patch notes. So we'll just leave it at saying that the other big fix that people have been asking for, or big mechanic that people have been asking for to return, is boarding, shipboarding which was a big part of how a lot of people played the New Republic especially. That is back for 3.0. We fixed the bug that it was having in the previous build, and now it is back and ready for action. There have been a few major changes for the tactical level. One of them is the addition of the new Supremacy game mode for Skirmish. Uh, this is something that I kind of previewed in its own video, so I'll link to that in the description, as well as a few other preview videos that we've done over the course of 3.0. But most of the big changes for tactical have come on the ground level. So there are kind of three main categories for this, although there were changes made in uh, kind of other balancing. But the main reworks for this have been reworking garrisons, reworking infantry, and changing the impact of ground to space weapons, or changing the availability of them, or space to ground rather, so bombing runs and orbital bombardments. The base shield and the turbo laser towers have been combined to make one structure you build called base defenses, so this gives you some turbo lasers around the ground map, as well as a local base shield where obviously you can't use bombing runs or orbital bombardments inside it, but on top of this there is now also a planetary shield structure which prevents using those kind of orbital weapons across the whole map. The health of bombing run units has also been nerfed significantly, so if you don't have a clear path to your, car to your target, there's a good chance that your bombers will get shot down by AA guns or even sometimes other units. This is something that we may turn back a little bit in the future, but right now we're kind of happier with having these weapons still play a key role in ground battles, especially in the cleanup phases, but not just ending them by standing around, holding fast forward, and waiting until you can just nuke everything out of existence. Part of why we felt comfortable doing this is because we have reduced the garrisons, so they are no longer unlimited garrisons from all structures. Uh, infantry is unlimited, so as long as you have a barracks or a senate building or something, you'll typically be able to have some options to hold the planet, but you have to be a bit more careful with your vehicle resources, and there shouldn't be the same slogs to take certain planets. This has come alongside a lot of work on maps where there are a ton of new maps that have been added, but I've also gone through and cut a lot of maps that we felt were not really up to par. So there, about half of the maps in the previous version were removed, and while this does mean that in the short term there will be some maps that turn up a little bit more, we tried to do a bit better of a distribution across the galactic map with different tactical maps, and there were a bunch that were added by our expanding map team who have been working really hard on getting those done. This is going to be something that takes a few releases to fully finish. Uh, there are still a few vanilla maps in particular that uh, can be a little bit sloggy, like the Coruscant map. That's one that's really high priority to replace but it should be in a lot better place than it was in previous releases. The last thing I mentioned there was the infantry reworks. So they have been completely rebalanced and we're trying to smooth a lot of that stuff out. Uh, commandos have been mostly rebalanced. That is one area where there's probably still gonna be some future work. And especially the Empire of the Hand, which was mostly outside of some of these reworks. They are getting their whole ground roster redone at the same time, hopefully in the future. Uh, so they've mostly just been some maintenance work. But for everyone else, infantry should feel a lot better and 
there should be more variety in what you're seeing with them. Uh, this is especially the case with the use of field bases, where there's even more infantry types that have been put in. The New Republic ground infantry in particular have been split into a few different types, so you'll see a lot of those as you play through. Some of these changes to infantry in particular have meant that Jedi have been indirectly nerfed. There's something that we're going to be needing to look at a bit more. Uh, there have been some changes to compensate for that to Jedi in the last little while, but it is something that's going to need a more systemic look. Uh, that'll probably be happening in the next release cycle or two. But that's going to do it for our patch notes here today. Again, this is not an exhaustive look, but we're almost at 25 minutes. So that is a pretty good idea of what we've been working on with 3.0 and then a little bit of what you can expect in the future. I did do a video last week talking about not just the release date for this, but some of what you can expect going forward. And you'll see more, uh, more information on that as we start getting into the point one cycle. So I'd like to thank the entire team for working so hard on this. It's been a long time since the last release. It's been almost a year in this release cycle, but we're pretty happy with how this one went. And we're going to be keeping an eye on everything to uh, do some hot fixes and get any initial issues that pop up. That's always going to be the case. We're going from a relatively small testing pool to a bunch of people playing at once. So any issues that come up, we're going to keep an eye on. And there will probably be a couple hot fixes just like Father Republic over the first few weeks as we get into the point one development cycle. But hope you all enjoy the mod. Thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.